Okay, well, welcome. Thank you for joining us for our program. My name is Helen Liu, and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I'd like to take the moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like today's event to you. I would also like to thank the Lexington Field and Garden Club for partnering with us on this program. Today, botanist, medical biochemist, and author Diana Beresford Kroger will talk about the plants and trees that need to go into the ground in Lexington and the surrounding area for the health and well-being of its residents and for the long-term sustainability of life on Earth. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A or chat, and Diana will answer them at the end of the program. When you submit a question, let us know if you are a gardener and where you are joining us from. I'm now going to pass the mic to Kitty Galatsis, who will introduce our special guest this evening. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, the Lexington Field and Garden Club, together with Cary Library, is delighted to sponsor a talk by Diana Beresford Kroger, who is coming to us from Ontario, near Ottawa. When I learned that Diana had agreed to speak to us, I didn't know what aspect of her incredible knowledge she would speak about. I was surprised and most pleased to learn that she had come up with a bio plan for Lexington. We gardeners and others are concerned with the effects of climate change on our environment, our flowers and our trees and look forward to what Diana can tell us. Diana, as, as Helen mentioned is the author of many books, some of which the library has, and several films, and she's made it her life's work to advocate for the health and well-being of our, our natural world. She is writing a new book, which will come out soon, and I'm sure the library will include it in their collection. And without further ado, um, we look forward to hearing from Diana. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome everybody today. You're going to have a kind of an armchair talk for me. Um, let me describe to you where I live and how I'm living and what I'm doing. First off, I live in one square mile of forest. And in that one square mile of forest, I have a world based garden, um, which is uh, holds a huge arboretum and nuttery um, of all of the nut trees of North America, and some of them I'm, I'm trying to reestablish. I have a collection of beans. I have been breeding potatoes that are perhaps very, very good as an anti-cancer device. I have a very large water garden. I have um, borders, and I have an extraordinary kind of alley of black walnuts um, that is very long, very big and very beautiful right now because the leaves are all yellow. And the black walnuts, my husband and I have uh, planted them about 50 years ago. And um, they have different tastes, different flavors. And the walnut, I suppose you know, the black walnut, Juglans nigra, is a medicinal tree and the, the tree itself produces very different kinds of nuts. Um, some of the nuts are, are sweet, some of them are sour, some of them have a butter taste on the mouth. And we do nut trials on them. Uh, we will be doing them probably in a month's time, my husband and I, just to see if the flavors are there, if they're correct. But remember, the black walnut was one of the species that fed North America once upon a time. And the people who ate the black walnut um, have a remarkable ability to, to um, avoid cancers, especially women who rub the leaf into the inside of their arm and it gives you a protection to breast cancer. And for little kids, um, they can hold the nut, the green nut in their hand, gives them a protection to leukemia, early childhood leukemia. Now, let me tell you a little bit about myself. It's, it's very easy to say I do this and I do that. Um, my training is I am a classical botanist, medical biochemist, 
My research has been in cardiac research, the oxidation reduction of cardiac reactions. I've made artificial blood. The artificial blood is used in, in tissue transplants. When you hear of tissue, tissue transplants all over the world, it's non-typing blood and it can carry oxygen into the organ being removed and moved to another person. And um, those are some of the things in surgery that I've done and also the radiation effects. Um, I have also studied radiation effects on, on the body and on nature. Um, so that and other things that I am very, very interested in. My keen interest is in um, medicinal aspects of trees, then you would think about forest bathing because I was the first person to start writing about that. And that would be uh, in 19 something, about 20 odd, five or six or more years ago. Um, and my books always hold medicine. And I've just finished doing the audio version of the book, just The Sweetness of a Simple Life. And that has been picked up by the medical community. Um, and the medical community take me very seriously, as a matter of fact. And uh, you will have that available to you, I think, probably by the end of the month, which is a very useful book to have in the house for man, woman or child. The other thing I'm very interested in, as I suppose you will, will expect from me, is I'm interested in climate change. I'm interested in answers to climate change, easy answers to climate change that you, you people and I can put into place. Um, as regards to the political world, I kind of ignore the political world. I think the answers will have to be enacted initially by you and I, and I'm talking about all over the world. I'm not necessarily talking about your little corner, my little corner. We all have got this kind of funny jiggle in our memory and in our mind that we know it's important. The children especially know that they may not possibly have a future and we will not do this to them. We will act as mentors to our children and to our grandchildren and we will, you and I, will make sure that they are okay. Just quickly about myself as a very strange person in a way, because I have, I have uh, ancient wisdom. I have the Banshankas in the Gaelic world, in the Gaelic uh, language. On Banshankas means a provenance. There is a provenance on me as a person. And my provenance of history, my bloodlines go back 3000 years. My family were coming, my mother's family were O'Donoghue Beras. They were, uh, um, you'd call them aristocrats, ancient Irish aristocrats. They worked from the Castle of Ross. You can look at the Castle of Ross near Killarney right now, actually on the internet, and see the family home. And when I was a child of 11, 12, um, my family was killed. And uh, to put it very quickly, and I was taken into a Brehan wardship. In Ireland, Ireland was uh, the part of the Celtic culture. The Celtic culture stretched 2000 years ago before the birth of Christ, stretched from Ireland into England, into the Baltic countries, south of the Baltic countries, into Ukraine too, into the northern area of Africa into the Galatia of Turkey and on into Asia Minor. It was a massive, massive civilization. And most of you come from that civilization and don't know a great deal about it. The language of Gaelic is very similar to Russian in the spoken form and in the listening form, it's very similar. I speak the Old Gaelic, the Middle Gaelic and the New Gaelic. Now, I was taken as a Brehan ward the Brehan laws in Ireland are pre Magna Carta, which means they were there and formed before the Magna Carta of England. They were there before the Napoleonic Code, which is a very ancient thing. In the Brehan laws, women had rights. There could be women doctors, women, women surgeons. They were extraordinary. 
they designed the Cologne calendar. They were mathematically superior to most other people in philosophy and in ability to conduct their lives. So I was the last child of mm. a very ancient family. And rather than giving me money, which my father's family would have given me money, had I not been a daughter, I in primogenitor in my father's family, I got nothing but my name Beresford. But in my mother's family, I was taken for a three year wardship called the Brehan Wardship. And I was taught all the ancient things of Ireland. I was told that at the time of now, that is the time of today, there will be a great need, not necessarily for knowledge, but for wisdom. They teach knowledge at universities and wisdom on the streets. So I was taught all of the old wisdom now. In Ireland, the basis of the language is called, was called in that time, the script called the Ogham script. And that is the basis of the language I'm speaking today. You and I are speaking that language and understanding part of that language today. And the Ogham script was based on sacred trees. And these sacred trees were living and there before the birth of Christ. The language was understood through the trees, through the wisdom of the trees, through the knowledge of the trees, and there to protect the trees for all of society and all of the human family. So then as a child, I was taken out into the fields and in the old ways where the Druidic uh, people had lived, I was taken up to the altars, the stone altars, the cairns. I was shown the ring cairns, the cranogs. I was shown all of these things. And the medicines of the fields were taught to me. And I thought I'd never remember any of them. The medicines of the, the, the uh, oceans were taught to me. I thought I'd never remember them. But somehow, um, repetition and the idea that maybe what I was being told was really true, um, somehow, for some reason, I, I remembered. That is why I did medical biochemistry. That is why I tried to link the old world into the new world. And then something very strange happened when I came to Canada. I was aware that the Aboriginal people, that the, the Indigenous peoples of Canada and the US knew me. I don't know how they did. They knew me. I am the woman who is protected by the golden eagle during the daytime. And I'm protected by the whippoorwill, the song of the whippoorwill at night. And that was what identified me to the, to the peoples of North America. And I'm very happy to know that they are such extraordinary, wonderful people. You can ask me about the Celtic culture later on if you want to open, open field on me because you're not going to get too many people with my scientific background um, speaking in this way because I think it's essential that we open up our hearts to what we are about to do. About 50 years ago, when I came to Canada, about 50 years ago, give or take, whatever, um, I met an elderly man, and he was really, I would think maybe in his 80s at that time. So I was a young sprite of a woman with my husband Christian on the, on the east coast of Canada. And he came up to me and he said, where's the Irish woman? Well, that's me. And he said to me, he said, sure, have you ever seen black potatoes? And of course, I had never seen black potatoes. So he said, no, can, can we, you do something with me? He said, I'll give you a bag of black potatoes if you will send me a bag of Peruvian purple potatoes. So I thought, well, you know, nothing venture, nothing gain. He sent me the black potatoes and I sent him the purple potatoes. But in the meantime, he was a wonderful person. 
And he told me that when he was a young boy, now that would be maybe, God bless us, maybe 150 years ago, something like that, 100 and something years ago. As a little, little boy, he had a, he had a memory of being by the sea. And he said in the springtime that the birds, the flocks of birds were so great coming into the maritime areas that they blotted out the sky and they blotted out the sun. And there was times of great darkness when the birds came flying back in their migrations into turtle land of, of North America. You know, that was something I really remembered. And I thought to myself then, and I do think to myself now, oh my, how times have changed. In the last 20 years, my husband and I, we haven't seen a bluebird. We have a bluebird trail. We haven't seen swallows, the great swallows, the tree swallows that we had 16 pairs of them. And you can go on and on like that. Then in the garden that we have, because it's an organic garden, I have loads and loads of different kinds of butterflies and insects and especially moths in the evening. And as time has gone by, the numbers have been decreasing. So we've got to take a, um, a, a good eye, put a good eye on our, the neighborhood around us and try to maintain it in a clean way. So now what I'm asking you to do is to forget your garden. Forget the idea that you have a garden and pay attention to the whole globe, to the planet. Pay attention to where you are living and how you are affecting the environment around you. So now in doing that, we can do something really quite extraordinary. We can enact the bio plan. And don't ask me where this bio plan came from. And I wrote it. And your darling man, E.O. Wilson, Professor E.O. Wilson, who was a wonderful friend of mine, he got very excited about the concept of the bio plan. And I'm going to read this for you. The bio plan is the blueprint print for all connectivity of life in nature. It is the fragile web which keeps each creature in balance with its neighbor. It is predation and prey. It is the victor and victim in a vast cycle of elemental life, which is almost beyond our comprehension. It is the quantum mechanic of the green chloroplast without which we would all die. It is the domital hairs on the underside of deciduous leaves harboring the parasites for aphids. It is the UV, that is the ultraviolet traffic light signaling system in flowers for the insect world. You don't see them, but the insects see them and animals see them. It is the terpene aerosol SOS produced by plants. And, res and responds to invade and responds responds to in invasive damage. It is the toxin trick offered by plants. There are your medicines right there, offered by plants for the protection of the butterfly. There are your medicines again. It is the mantle of man. That is the mantle of your mantle and my mantle. A divine contact, a divine contract to all who share this planet. We are all equal. We all have something to say about our home. And our larger home is not Lexington, nor is it Ottawa, nor is it Canada, nor is it the United States. It is the planet Earth. And we have to beware now. We have to start looking after our planet. I am looking after it for you and I am hoping you will help me because I cannot do this alone. 
I was told as a child by a fortune prophet in the Celtic world when I was a Brehan ward that the time of now would also have great dangers. And I was told that I had to bring my education to as far as I could and that I was to pay attention to the planet. And I was told that I can help. But after me, there will be no more, no more ancient wisdom. I would be the last person to carry this wisdom in my mind. So please remember that and make use of me today. Now, let me go back and look at your gardens. In your gardening really is in your colder areas, you would be in the sixes, really. And depending on the location of your garden and the shadows of your garden, shade and wind and wind movement, especially now in the winter. Now, let me tell you what's happening in the winter in your garden. With climate change, snow is being super hydrated. And snow, the snow, uh, well, snow, what you call them, little snow pads that come down out of the sky, the snowflakes, because they're kind of like pads now. They're much bigger, much, much bigger. They come down sometimes in the, in the shape of a plate and a small saucer. They come down, they can rip the limbs off trees. So make sure that your shrubs are trimmed properly and that your trees are too. And that if you have trees facing the wind in a very windy area, have them as a V shape so that the effect of the snow will, will be least on these trees and they in turn will protect the other trees in your garden. Now, we've had a summer, my husband and I in the garden, and I want to tell you something that happened. We have wonderful peppers, but something very eerie happened. Um, one pepper, one lovely yellow pepper, uh, fell off the pepper, my pepper plants onto the ground and in 24 hours, it fried on the ground. That is, it was cooked. So now what do you expect will happen to the all the creatures living in the soil when they are in a boiling situation? It is not very good. So with increased temperatures, the design of your garden is very important. So you have to design it with an idea of long shade and high shade going into your, especially your vegetable garden and making sure that you have pollinators coming into that vegetable garden because the pollinator numbers are going down. How you bring in pollinators is you go out in the spring and you buy yourself 12 or 20 or 24 gladioli, pop them into your veggie garden and the gladioli will invite all kinds of pollinators to come in and you can put other plants flowering plants in there but the gladioli are pretty good for hummingbirds and so on and so forth so just think differently think differently about your garden now let me quickly look at the soil the soil is important it is important for you to have an organic garden that is do not spray all kinds of toxic carcinogenic material on your soil. And for heaven's sake, if you have children, do not do it in their presence. Wear masks if you are about to do it. Please do not do it. Now, I have a book that I have written and the book is A Garden for Life. You will probably have this in the library, A Garden for Life. And at the back of that book, is a whole set of recipes and programs on how to handle sprays and they are all non-toxic sprays. You, once you read the back of the book, you can photocopy it, copy it, do whatever you want to do. Read the back of the book. It means your children and your grandchildren, your dogs, your cats, your husbands, even your husbands can roll on the grass, roll on the soil around your house and will be perfectly clean and they will not be contaminated by toxins. So you will have a clean area. You, the, your garden will be clean if you're organic. Now, let me tell you something else. Think about the whole globe like a quilt. 
And all of us are pretty good at quilting. Even some men, I believe, are, are not too bad at the needle and they, they will quilt. What has happened? Think back in the last 200, 300, 400, 500 years, where you were living was a great savanna, where you were living, there were wonderful trees. And the USA has got the highest solar exposure. So the best trees in the world come from the United States of America and part of Canada. So now you have these extraordinary trees and instead of the trees, you have houses now. You have concrete over them. So I would say to you, pay attention to your trees. If you have even a small garden, you can use smaller trees, dwarf trees. But if you've got a good sized garden, start planting a tree, one tree each year for the next six years. If all of the people on the planet start planting one tree per year, for the next six years, we will stop climate change in its in its socks. Now, if you want to look up some guidance on this, look to the Call of the Forest film, look at it on, on the internet, and you will find there is an app with that called calloftheforest.ca, and it gives you all of the instructions for the area of 7A, 7B, 6B, or even 8A. So you would have a mixture of trees to plant and I have gone through those trees and the heavier woods are the woods that sequest carbon dioxide better than any other species. So put an eyeball on them, like the oak would be very good for your area, your area. Um, outside of your town, the carrier species, the hickory species, which are also feeding trees. Soil is not as simple as say. As the soil has got a connection with the trees that are growing around it and the, the shrubs and the plants growing around it, but it, it, essentially the trees. The trees have endogenous fungi inside in them and these, these fungi have only recently, fairly recently in the last 10, 20 years, basically been discovered to be a connecting system between the trees and the earth and the soil. Um, and it's a very, very important thing to know because without the um, endogenous fungi, you will have a lot of failures in your planting if you plant the trees into a poor soil. And that I can talk about too to you. I'm trying to keep online here with some of my ideas that I want you to know about. Um, now, to mulch your garden, it's very important. You don't want the soil to boil, okay? You don't want your plants to boil. So you can mulch the garden with things like rotten hay. That's what Chris and I do. And you're living in a fairly small town, a fairly small little area. So make friends with your farmers around you. You go out there with maybe an apple pie in your hand or something like that. You, you give and take with people and ask the farmers if, if you can have some of their rotten hay or their spoiled hay. And they will very gladly give you some of that hay. That hay is very, very good mulch for vegetables. It disappears into the ground and then you can put leaves on top of it. And believe it or not, you'll get a very good rich soil out of that. Um, grass cuttings also are very good. And then, of course, you have your compost. But I want to tell you something that's happening right now in autumn. Right today, you look out your window and you see it's happening. What's happening is the leaves are falling off the trees. And this is the fall, this is the autumn. But something else is actually happening, which is quite extraordinary, and you should know about this. The leaves fall off by means of a, a scissors enzyme called a, abscisic acid and falls, and the leaves fall on the ground. And I'm talking about deciduous <clears throat> trees. Like, like oaks and maples and sassafras and all the gorgeous trees that you have down there. <coughs> Just a minute, I have to. I, and this is not whiskey and it is not stout. <laughs> it's just water. Now, the leaves fall on the ground 
And if you've got some kids around, they can watch it when it's freezing and snowing. And you will see that there is a skeleton left on the ground. Sometimes you see that. <coughs> What's happened is the humic acid has left the leaves, gone into the rainwater and gone into the lakes. And from the lakes, gone into the seas, the oceans. You say, what is this kind of connection, Diana? What are you talking about? Yes. I just have to <coughs> take a coffee here. I've had an awfully busy day. Now, the humic acid travels into the lakes, travels into the water, and it comes from the leaves. As I said, humic acid is a high molecular weight molecule. It's an enormous molecule with all kinds of branching in it. In the branches, you have kind of a claw-like system of phenolic claw. And what that that molecule does is it loves iron. The land, believe it or not, is rich in iron and the sea is poor in iron. The humic acid grabs the iron and travels out to the sea, out into the great ocean, the saline ocean, and releases it into the waters of the ocean. And all of the algae in the ocean the microalgae and the macroalgae, the forests of algae in the ocean, are waiting for this iron. And this iron enables an enzyme called a nitrogenase enzyme to get moving. It puts oil, it puts gas in the car of that enzyme. And it causes all of the small microspecies, crococales, camisafinales, nosticales, all of these species to divide and to grow. That's the food of the ocean. That is what the great whales eat. That is what the tuna fish will eat. That is what the great mammals of the sea will eat. Your garden is feeding the ocean outside of Boston. So when I was flying into Boston several years ago, and I thought I was landing in the blinking water, I thought that we were coming down in the ocean. No, nope. I was landing in water that held the iron from your garden in the water. So your trees are connected to the oceans. The trees manage the oceans. The trees dictate the feeding foundations of the oceans. And if you look around the globe right today, you will see something very smart going on in Japan. The fishermen are planting forests. They are planting the forests back again so they can have fish. You see, we're all connected. We are all connected. Now I want to talk about one item. May I just have a couple of more little bits and pieces for you. One item called water in the garden. I don't care who you are, what you are. You can get a jam jar. You can get a bowl. You can get some vessel to hold water in the garden. You can make you can be like me and have a huge water garden. You can have some bowls. You can have a bird bath. OK, now, if you have a bird bath, um, keep the bird bath full and get um, a limestone, a lime, a bit, big bit of about the size of my hand, you know, a big limestone rock and put a bit of um, yogurt on it and leave that yogurt dry or milk on it. And that will give a protein film on that rock. And on that protein film, you'll have mosses and lichens will grow. That's how your that's how your butterflies and your moths will feed during the day and in the evening. They'll come down and they'll suck. The birds will come down and suck and the bees come to the edge of the water. So if you have a steep bowl and that's OK, you can use a bowl. Please put matchsticks in or please put lollipop sticks preferably lollipop sticks because they're made from pine and pines are um, um, a very, very clean species to put on water. And all of your pollinators will land on the sticks and they start guzzling the water into their intestinal area and bring that water to, to their hives. The insects are dying. They have to have water. They have to have food. 
And when you're buying your organic food, go to your farmer who has still got hedgerows around his field because those hedgerows keep the insects alive. The great oceanic farms with ocean-like fields do not do. Where will a bird land in those fields? Where will the insects land in those fields? So bear in your mind that now, from now on, for the rest of your life, water is very, very important. Um, and also, of course, let me say, you've got to keep them clean. You can't keep them dirty. Now, airways in your garden. This is the general design in your garden. You have high material, that's the trees, and you have shrubs, and then you have the tall perennials and short perennials. The trees are really essential in a garden. Even if it's a small tree, it's essential in a garden. Let me tell you why. Because the birds come and land on the trees and they expose their breasts breasts to the sun and their wings to the sun. Sometimes they straighten out their wings. The sun does something extraordinary to the vitamin D. It's a proto-vitamin D in the birds, in the birds' feathers, their breast feathers, their back feathers, and their, their, their wings. The proto-vitamin D is broken into true vitamin D, D3, D4, by the sun, the, the UV light of the sun, and that um, stays on the fur of the bird, right? When the bird is high and protected, he preens and peens that um, vitamin D off his skin and off his fur. There's his egg laying. If he has successful vitamin D, he can successfully lay, she can successfully lay eggs. And the father bird can protect them and the father bird know they're in the nest. So, so you have to keep your eyes open. So if you have trees in your, in your garden, you also have birds. And if you have trees in your garden and you have a vegetable garden, you really want those birds because they come and eat the insects. It kind of goes like that. And the trees have a memory for the airways, but, there's one other thing you could do is when you brush your cat, when you brush your dog um, or even yourself, go and buy a coconut, empty out the coconut, eat what's in the coconut and stick all the hairs from your dog, your cat, your horse even into the coconut, pop it into the onto the ground, hide it in the garden somewhere. This is what the birds need for tying their uh, tying their their nests together. And in the olden times, they'd land on a horse in a field and pick all the hairs off the back of the horse and go and bring them to the nest. But unfortunately, downtown Lexington, I don't think there are too many horses you can do that with. But you can certainly help the mat matters along by <laughs> combing your dog, combing your, your cat. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about fragrance. Um, please have as much fragrance as possible in your garden. Um, what fragrance does is it makes you stand and stop. I don't know if you've noticed, if you see some beautiful roses, you know, man or woman or child, you'll stop and smell the roses. You know, I mean, that's an old saying, you stop and smell the roses. Ah, but you don't just do that. You stop and your cortisol levels start to go down. And the fragrance from the rose enables that leveling out of your cortisol levels. It has a positive effect on your kidneys. It has a positive effect on your adrenal glands. And I can go on and on and on about this in medicine, which is fascinating for me. Lexington, think of the globe. I'm asking you if somebody who is running the, the city if they could possibly think of planting in some pine trees, it could be Pinus strobus, it could be Pinus tideus, it could be any one of the pines. And I would like the city fathers and city mothers to put in maybe from five to 10 pines into an area of a park um, in the city itself and protect them until they've grown. Now, what I am saying to you is that these pines produce pinene alpha 
and beta pinene as an airborne aerosol. What this airborne aerosol does for you is something extraordinary for men, for women, for children, for dogs, for cats, for animals. You go to that area to sit, to walk around, strengthen your shoulders, walk upright, and you want breathing, deep breathing into the lower parts of your lungs. You get alpha and beta piney into the lower parts of your lungs. Not the upper, not this, <laughs> but deep, deep breathing. Relax, have a girlfriend, boyfriend, friend, or whatever with you for 15 minutes. That 15 minutes per month gives you a full protection to cancer. This research has been done out of Japan. All of the clinical studies have been done out of Japan. Make good use of that in your city. Make sure that your kids do that, hang around these places and that they're healthy. And for the kids to pick up pieces of fragmented pine in their hand or pine cones in their hand, because that also has an antidote to Streptococcus aureus. That's the skin eating disease. Look, it's an easy thing to do. If you want to see how you forest bathe, and I, I'm talking about forest bathing some more in my next book, which is now being edited right now, and it'll be out in a number of months. Um, just read that or look at the film Call of the Forest. I would advise you to keep that in you, that film in your mind. Um, because it gives you little tips and every time you see it, you see something different. Um, I, I was talking to a particle physicist recently who teaches at the University of Toronto, a very smart guy. And he came up to me and he says, well, I know you. Well, I didn't think he knew me. I'd never seen him before. He says, well, you just did a film. He said, and it's well nigh on perfect. I know it never saw so much science in it. Well, if that's from a physicist and he's got some good stuff from it, you as a gardener will sniff out a whole lot more. Um, uh, there's another thing that I'm involved in the design in, and I am very interested in, and it is, it is these are health gardens around your hospitals. Um, I will be involved in designing a health garden for a hospital in, in Toronto. Um, and I am really, really interested in this. I have contributed to the International Handbook of Forest Therapy. And you can accelerate the healing of people who have had virus infections, who have had all kinds of problems uh, in, in cancers by having a healthy healing garden as part of your, your hospital. Very easy to do, very cheap to maintain, but it helps everybody, not just one person, everybody. So now another little tip, tip about your gardens and then I'm going to talk about some flowers that I want you to grow that are endangered around you. In the fauna, please keep fauna in your garden, snakes and, and you know, snakes and <laughs> frogs and toads and every kind of newts, every kind of creature. You need rocks. Put in some rocks somewhere so that a snake can, a milk snake or, uh, you know, a green snake or something like that can slither in and around. Snakes eat a lot of mosquitoes. Snakes are very good. And all the other creatures that need to crawl in around walls and stuff. So you have, you will have a garden that's full of active life. And then if you have that, then you'll have the owls, all the different owls coming in and all of the different night feeders coming in on flight. So, I mean, it's, if you've got kids and grandkids, I mean, it's it's, it's marvellous for a child to see a great horned owl as be almost as big as themselves. I mean, this is this is this is what the Aboriginal people like to look at and like to think about. It's not eliminating them all, shooting them and getting rid of them. It's having them sharing the planet with you. Um, so in some senses, these rocks can be thought of as a little small hospital or a little small place for the, the, for the mother snakes to produce their baby snake. And I mean, it's, it's very interesting. And by the way, I'm speaking a little bit of Gaelic here because the word hospital on Oistbidale in ancient Gaelic is the word for hospital. The word hospital comes from Gaelic. 
so you don't know you're speaking Gaelic. And I presume you'll go out to your cars later on, get into your car, and there you go. Car is an ancient Gaelic name for car. Then what you do is your, your orchestration of all the species in the garden and do go wild. Please do go wild in your garden. Have all uh, as many as you can of the native species. Now I'm going to talk to you about a few of these He's here and Stuart can send you, uh, Helen, maybe a copy of this and you can have it in the library. Um, I want you to put in the wood poppy. It's a, a celandine poppy, and it's also called Stylophorum diphylum. That is disappearing. It does live around you. It is a poppy that the First Nations used, that the indigenous people used as a war paint. But actually, as a war paint, the, it's, the, it's the nodules in the ground itself, the rhizomes in the ground that hold the, the very strong anti-cancer chemical for melanoma. We need to have species of with melanoma, anti-melanoma in them around our garden. And I bet not one of you have got these species growing. Now, if you have and you get them going, please take care of them because, because climate change will knock out a lot of these rare species. The next one for you that I have massive Whales of bloodroot, Sanguinaria canadensis, in and all around the garden. And it is absolutely in my garden and in, into the, the, the borders and the area it grow. It is absolutely stunning in the spring. And people come in and say, oh, well, did you plant? Oh, no, it planted itself, but it looks after itself and it's absolutely gorgeous. Now, the plenum, that's the double version, double flowered version of that, is available, but it's a later flowering one. So you could have the single one first and then the plenum afterwards. And you can have the plenum rosea too. And you, you know, you can play with this. The Virginian bower, bower vine, the Clematis virginiana. The Clematis virginiana, if used properly, is an extraordinary climbing, gorgeous, gorgeous species that will bring in all kinds of birds and pollinators into your garden. And it's called Clematis virginiana. And mine has crossed with a number of, of Clematis that I have in the garden. And I've got one fabulous, um, I don't know what to call it. It's, it's a hybrid. So I dare say I'll come up with the name one of these days. It's just gorgeous. Now you folks should have Virginia bluebells. They're called Mertensia virginiana. And they're a species of your great woods. They're the species that were on the ground. Fragrant, fragrant, beautiful, wonderful species. And they disappear at the end of June. So you have something to deal with in the palette of, in the palette of your garden. They are gorgeous and they are fragrant. And do please look after them. Another one is called Black Cohosh. Black cohosh is called bugbane. <clears throat> bugbane. Oh Lord, excuse me. <clears throat> it's called Simsifusia racemosa. Okay, it can be white, and I've bred a darker chocolate version of this. This was the vibe that the plant that was given to young boys when they reached seven years of age, and they went on to their dream stones when they were dreaming of their future. And it has got the ability to accelerate um, athletic prowess. This is a really, really interesting plant. So I have lots of that. And my husband, Christian, really loves it. And one, um, one, one evening, I happened to be looking out the kitchen window and the whole plant in front of the kitchen was covered with most beautiful, beautiful moths. <clears throat> I turned on the light and they were just gorgeous. So you can drag the kids out from bed. And you can say, you go and look at those. Another beauty, a little small one, if you've got a tiny garden or an area that you want to plant into a good long patch is the crested dwarf iris. 
And the crested dwarf iris is absolutely stunningly gorgeous. It has a huge flower and a tiny little body and it just likes to creep and crawl along, but it is absolutely glorious. There's alba versions and blue versions and it, it, it's just a gorgeous plant. That is an American plant and you rarely see it anywhere. We've got to protect that one because there's medicine connected with that. And I have a special little friend and it's called the Calico Aster. Um, the Calico Aster is Aster latifolius and it's beautiful. It has a tiny little shape of a, an elm tree. It's gorgeous. The next one is, I'm being quick now because I should shut up. <laughs> the next one is the giant hyssop comes from the southern part of, of the United States, Agastasia nepentoides. And in my garden this year, it is 11 feet to 12 feet tall. And that feeds every, every moving bee, every pollinator, every everything. And it is like, it's like an army of these creatures of plants. I mean, you can't believe they're plants. People come into my vegetable garden and say, what in heaven's name is that? So it is uh, Agastasia nepentoides. And then the, there's the last one, because you're living near the sea, you're near, you are near enough to the sea that you, you might have estuaries or you might have an area with this in. I'm asking you to look for and to find and some one of you to plant Apios Americanos. And what that one is, it's called the ground nut and it is called the potato bean. And it grows to eight feet tall and it's a member of the legume family. And it is fragrant, fragrant, like a thousand hyacinths in the air. But it is one of the foods of the First Nations. And they would dug this dig, this string of, of well, oh, I suppose, potato tubers from under the Apios Americanos. But potato tubers and all of the leguminosae stabilize the epigenome of the, the genetic material of your body. I think, I think as we go on into looking at cancers, we're going to find that this is a very important plant. It only replicates by triploids, so you, not tetraploids. You have to have triploids. So there's that's the hint for you to replicate it, and it will come from cuttings. But some one of my listeners here, because I can't do it, I'm too far away from the sea. Please find Apios Americanus for me and for you especially. So I have to thank you now and we will participate in mangling the rest of the day. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, well. Another question is, what are the best insects and animals to eat mosquitoes? Are there some plants or trees that are better than others to keep away mosquitoes? Um, no, the... the um, the First Nations did something kind of interesting. What they did is they they used this the leaves, uh, the fresh leaves and the mature leaves of poplar, poplar, um, poplar plant, a poplar tree, and they would chew them a little bit, and they would rub them, and they used that as a bandage on very badly bitten mosquito. Um, on mosquito flesh. Now, as far as um, getting rid of the mosquitoes, um, my husband and I in our garden this year, um, uh, it would have been about five weeks ago, I think, we had a storm that came up from the south and we had a variety of mosquito that came into our area, which was a very, very small mosquito. And it came up with that storm. And they were vicious. They got in everywhere. And I would say we had a plague of mosquitoes. And to be honest with you, I have never seen anything like that before, nor have any of my farming neighbours seen anything like that before, because Chris and I went and asked them. But let me tell you something else. With an increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, carbon goes into the exoskeleton of a lot of creatures, a lot of insects. And what you do is have an increased body mass an increased ability and an increased ability to lay eggs. So it is a side swipe from climate change. Now, what I do in the garden is I wear white and white helps to repel them. What I do is I go to neighborhood services and Chris goes to neighborhood services and we get a good, strong 
very big um, shirt and put the shirt on over whatever it is we're wearing. And you get a, re a re the light is repelled by that, you know, reflection from the white, and that really helps. And that's as much as I, I can help you with. Thank you. I think um, you had mentioned that snakes eat mosquitoes, and so um, oh, the question well, was you know, in regards to like insects or other animals that might eat mosquitoes as well. So um, designing your garden in a way to bring those animals or insects in. Well, okay, come here now. I have a cat. My cat eats mosquitoes. I mean, the cat goes after mosquitoes like crazy. I, all, all the animals will 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 see mosquitoes and get irritated by them and eat them. So, yeah, that's so. I was I was thinking of us. I was being selfish and thinking of our precious flesh. Uh, ah, lots of things. Uh, bats. bats. For God's sake, bats. I mean, if you've got any bats left uh, left uh, alone at all, a lot of them have got the disease, the nose disease. But but we do have bats, Chris and I do have lots of bats, and so not this not this year. We didn't sit out and watch them snap the uh, snap the um, mosquitoes. But bats eat it; their weight in mosquitoes. I mean, bats are fantastic. Don't be scared about bats; they just fly in and take a bunch of of mosquitoes. Yeah. They're all all the different kinds of bats, mm -hmm. and you can put up a bat house in your in your garden. So yeah, there are lots lots of ways of getting rid of mosquitoes, but um yeah, in, uh, probably enticing bats is probably the best one I would think. Yeah, that and they're wonderful <laughs> to watch. Um, yeah. I guess the um person who asked about the bittersweet had mentioned that it's um it's Japanese, not native. Ah, uh, okay, then get your shovel. <laughs> you know what to do with that get your shovel get them get it out get it away you want you want your north american native species there you don't want intruders coming in on this one no and 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 that can be bad i know get the shovel out and actually you know you could have you could invite some friends with the shovel and make a very nice dinner or make a very nice lunch and just have a shovel party wonderful with there's nothing wrong with that. Say Diana said it, and then you can blame me. <laughs> Thank you. And so we have time for one last question. Um, it's been a masked year for oak trees where there is an abnormally high number of acorns on the ground. Our property is very shallow with a lot of rock. Do you have any particular recommendations of what to do with the acorns for planting? Also, are there some good recipes for cooking with acorns? what kind of acorn what kind of tree what kind of oak tree is uh, it they did not mention what kind of oak tree well go mention it now find out <laughs> get it it's the white oak if it's a red oak if it's a white oak if it's a white mm -hmm. uh, um corpus alba then you can eat the, the acorns and the acorns are actually sold in in many places across the world in fairs and in markets, farmers markets. And um, what you do is you take them, uh, take this the shell off and grind them just into flour, and that flour makes a bannock. Uh, so I guess they're speaking about red oaks, um, and then oh. uh, white oak acorns haven't matured yet. So I guess that's kind of like an answer to that as well. Uh, well, red oaks, uh, you know, really, they need to have potassium hydroxide run through them, ashes run through them. Um, and you can get the tannin out of red oaks doing that, wash them in, in tannin, and then um, and then make, um, you know, your bannock, your flour out of that. But I don't think that it is as good as you would expect it to be. Personally, I wouldn't eat that. Thank you. I know... The First Nations did eat it, but I, I don't think I would. Now, now let me tell you something that that um, the farmers used to do in Canada and in the United States once upon a time. The Aboriginal people had ownership of the oak trees and the oak trees were part of the great savanna of the Americas. And um, they flash fire to these savannas in the spring and in the November and, and had ash and potassium hydroxide in the ground, even in shallow ground. And the nuts, the acorns that were produced were fantastic. And the acorns from the white oaks, all of the white oaks 
could be eaten as a sweet acorn and made into a flower. And that flower is very good for you. And all of the farmers were taught by the Indians, by the Aboriginal people to look for those sweet acorns. And there was a democracy of trees once upon a time. And once they came across these sweet acorns, they had ownership of that tree, irrespective of the land. So there's a huge history around some of those things. Um, and I would say, you do the same thing. The farmer that we bought our land from, Grant Baker, he went out and he, if he saw an oak tree, he'd test it, he'd try it. It's, it's a smart thing to do in a way, to find out where your wild source of food is. So um, just learn very easily learn the difference between the red oak by, you know, just looking at some 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 books of, of uh, tree books, the red oak and the white oak. You know, you've your pointed leaves and you've got the smooth leaves, but they do hybridize. So because they hybridize, then you have to kind of check them out. But they're, they, you know, the food is there. But if she's got shallow ground and if she has or she or he a shallow ground and it is a limestone ground, then I would say to you, put in some of the carrier species, some of the shagbark hickories, because you'll get nuts from them and they don't really mind the shallow ground too much. And we know that as a fact, because part of our hickory plantation is on super shallow ground for of about 12 inches only. And then there's rock and these trees are going gangbusters. So have a shot at that. Thank you. I um, wanted to get this last question in. Um, I want to be mindful of everyone's time, including yours. But I just wanted to get this one last question in um, since we um, want to make sure we just answer all of them. So what do you think about Norway maples and Japanese maples in our area? Uh, not, not a whole lot. Um, they're, I, I want to see native species going into America. But if somebody's got a Japanese maple, um, it's a beautiful thing. Go and enjoy it, but don't plant another one. And if you have a Norway maple, do the same thing. Don't plant another one. Put in America. The United States of America has the most extraordinary array of trees in the world. So go out and find a native species, like, for instance, Catalpa speciosa. The, the, the orchid tree that grows in an extraordinary way, has a head of flowers on it in July, that's par none, and has, you know, propagates all kinds of insects. It's a fabulous tree. So I say stick with the native, because if you've got native trees, then you know you're feeding your own birds, you know you're feeding the butterflies, and you know you're, you know, the, the Catalpa speciosa has got huge leaves too. So you got shade from that also. Wonderful. Well, Diana, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I wanted to let everyone know that we will have a link to the recording in a week or so. And along with that link, um, I'm hoping to receive the list of native species that Diana mentioned um, that we should plant. And I yeah. will include yeah. that in the, the recap. And I think Kitty wants to come back and uh, thank you as well. Yes, <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, lots of fascinating uh, little tidbits there that we shall cherish. And, and I have to say, my husband and I uh, just got a hold of a couple of Catalpa saw. Ah. We're going to put them carefully somewhere on our land because uh, the blossoms are incredible. Yeah, put them near the house, put them fairly near the house. They're fairly shallow rooted and they can withstand they can withstand ice and storms amazingly well. And the flowers are fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Do you know something? We've lost all the knowledge of where those Catalpa speciosas originally came from in the United States. Nobody knows where they came from. But there's a Catalpa bignoides also, which I don't think is as good as the speciosa. And there's another species in, in China. So, boy, you've got one marvelous tree. So have you got seeds? Is that what you're putting in the seeds? You're propagating by seed? That's We dug up some saplings that were oh, okay. in a bad uh, place. So we dug them up and we're- Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, then water them very well and mulch them quite a bit. 
and uh, maybe put a bit of protection around them for this winter because God knows what's going to happen. We're going to probably have a mouse explosion or something. And if they chew the stem of these young trees, oh, don't let that happen. Get a tin can or something like that and put it around around those trees. Huh. That's a cheap way of doing it, you know. Well, we <laughs> certainly appreciate you speaking to us. And um, uh, I hope that uh, your trip to Ireland coming up is is wonderful. And uh, oh, me too. <laughs> we'll look forward to your new book. Yeah, me too. I'm going to labor and I'll have a book. <laughs> wonderful. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Have a good night. Thank you. And the best of wishes to you too. Thank you. Bye-bye.